Hi, everyone. It's Ben Kaznoka, a partner here at Village Global. We're joined today by Jimmy Zani, the author of a new book, The Founders, The Story of PayPal and the Entrepreneurs Who Shaped Silicon Valley. Jimmy, welcome to the Village Global podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me, Ben. I really appreciate it. So let's start with an easy question. Tell us the story of PayPal in three minutes or less. <laughs> You're asking me to distill distill five and a half years of my life into three minutes, but I will, I, I will endeavor to do it. Um, to you know, take a step back, there are a number of PayPal alumni who today do things in the world that are, are expansive and big. Uh, you know, the names will be familiar to the people listening. Elon Musk, Reid Hoffman, Peter Thiel, Max Levchin, David Sachs, and scores of others. Um, as a group, these people came together to build the company that we know as PayPal between the years, roughly 1998 to 2002, is when this company came into being. I, uh, several years ago, was just thinking about that group as a group, meaning not kind of at the individual innovator level, but as a, as a unit, as a team. And I, I mean, I don't think I'm the only one, but I, I sort of started to think just like, how is it possible that all of these people were in one place at one time? Like, this is kind of crazy. You know, this is like the 90s Bulls or the Avengers or some, you know, it's like the revolutionary generation in America, like with Reed Hoffman, Elon Musk, David, even just those three in a room, you're like, wow, that's pretty impressive to be in one company at one time. The, the, the short version of the story is that two companies fused into one. Elon Musk developed a company called X.com, which was going to inaugurate a revolution in finance. It was going to unite everything in finance into one place. Max Levchin, Peter Thiel, along with their co-founders, Luke Nosek, Russ Simmons, Ken Howery, and Yupan, but principally Max and Peter as the initial original co-founders, create a company called Confinity. It was actually first called Fieldlink, then it was called Confinity. Confinity births a product called PayPal. PayPal's original conception is beaming money between Palm Pilots a product that evolves to become emailing money between you know, two people or a group of people. In early 2000, X.com and Confinity merge and sort of call it modern PayPal is roughly born around that time. And the next two plus years in my story are an absolutely insane, intense adventure to take the company to scale, build a business model that works, take the company public and then uh, sell it to eBay. It's an incredible company that's obviously at a scale today that few of these founders probably ever imagined uh, when they started the company. Um, what do you think are the three or four most important takeaways for entrepreneurs from the PayPal story, especially for, for young entrepreneurs today who might not have lived through that era? What are sort of the transferable lessons and insights that we can take with us today from the PayPal journey? Yeah, again, you're you're asking me to take a laundry list and, and pick the best three or four. So I will I will do my best, but suffice it to say, there are many, right? And they emerge at different moments in the story. Um, if I were to pick a few of them, the ones that that really stood out to me, one is um, I, I found that that the company was far more heterogeneous than people think. You know, it, it, we actually have this conception of the PayPal story where it's young men and a small group of them. Well, actually the company is several hundred people at the time of its IPO across Omaha, Nebraska and Palo Alto. And there are folks who have been in industry and financial services for a long time. And there are also people who this is their first job out of college. There are people who are uh, incredible pathbreaking engineers. There are also people who you know could squeeze money out of a stone if, if business development required it, right? And so I think that, that what I take away from that is, is that the company was successful in part because of its heterogeneity, right? It actually had all these people who came from different walks of life, who had different experiences, and I can track specific product innovations to the background of each of those people. So I sort of saw it like come to life in, in, a, in a really crystal clear way. I, I'll go a small example. Sanjay Bargava is a financial service executive. He develops this technology called random deposit that you, I, and everybody listening has used, which is using two small deposits to confirm bank accounts, right? He invents that. He creates it. Absent his experience in fintech, or in, I'm sorry, in financial services, the company might not have had that breakthrough insight, which leads to that product. So that's kind of one thing is like, I think we should emphasize heterogeneity in hiring maybe more than we do. So um, can I just can I, not, can I jump yeah, in there, Jimmy? I think absolutely. That's great. And I want to get to your two or three other key lessons for entrepreneurs, but just to, to dwell on this for a second, because 
you're right. A lot of people do have a perception mm -hmm. of PayPal as homogeneous as a lot of the same, you know, a lot of you know, basically white men uh, of the same age, same university backgrounds, et cetera, who came together. And I believe uh, Max Levchin or somebody, Peter Thiel or uh, Heath Raboy, somebody on Quora along the way once replied to a question about why PayPal was successful, saying that it was the lack of diversity on the founding team that may have led them all to trust each other and thus move more quickly in those early days. So do you think the heterogeneity story is a at scale reality? Like, hey, they scaled and ultimately became more diverse. And would you accept the premise that in those early formative months, the fact that they all were quite similar to each other is what allowed them to be more trusting? Or is that actually a, a misunderstanding of those early days? Yeah, I actually think, and, and I'm going to, it's a, it's a bit of a misunderstanding. And what happened is there's that, that quote has been taken a bit out of context by people in, in the media, uh, I would argue, because actually, <laughs> it's, it's funny you mentioned it, because what Max is talking about in that instance is the, the, the lack of diversity he wants is a lack of diversity about arguing about which programming language is the best programming language. So he actually like is making a very different, very specific point, but it got kind of like the back half of the quote got sort of shorn off on Twitter and like everybody ignored it. But, but in point of fact, like if you look particularly at Elon's half of the company, which obviously you know, it's half the company, you know, he, his earliest hires come from all over. Uh, there's men, there's women, there's old and young. And so I actually don't think it's a, it's a, they were heterogeneous at scale. The, the homogeneity around the choice of computer programming language, I mean, I think you could argue for or against that. It, by the way, Max's quote there is really important because what he says is, there are some things worth arguing about that don't impede progress. There are some things you argue about and it impedes progress. Arguing about the programming language would have impeded our ability to move more quickly. But arguing about big things like marketing, actually, those are great arguments to have. And so I, I would argue that I think that that the the if you were to look at even two of the people, obviously one who you know very well, like Reid Hoffman and Peter Thiel couldn't be more different in some ways, right? And yet they occupy the CEO and the COO spots in this company at a very early time. Call it intellectual heterogeneity, but whatever you want to call it, this team does not think alike. And I don't think that that's, I don't, I don't think thinking alike is a source of their strength. I actually think it's the opposite. I think they had a vast group of people with a lot of differences of opinion. Okay, excellent. So what's the next lesson or insight you think entrepreneurs today could take from the PayPal journey? I think that one of the biggest things that I noticed in the story that honestly kind of made me laugh at the beginning, and then I realized the depth of the insight, you know, we're often there's often this sort of mantra of, of entrepreneurs should try to solve a problem in their lives. And to be clear, great businesses have emerged from that instinct, meaning I see a problem, it's my problem, I'm super close to it, I've got really good finger feel, and I can solve it. PayPal is not that. <laughs> in fact, PayPal initially finds its success by solving a problem on this, at the time, medium-sized, but still growing auction website called eBay. Confinity's earliest employees and X.com's earliest employees are not eBay users. They are, in fact, like, actually, they think of eBay as like vaguely distasteful, right? And they would sort of speak about it in very pretty comedic terms. PayPal fixes a broken payment services operation on a website that its earliest employees never used. But what they did that was really, really where I think the insight is, is once they discovered that this market, eBay, was where their product, PayPal, had fit, they obsessed over it. They became the power users to end all power users. And so I think the insight is don't always assume that you're looking for your problem and trying to fix your problem. If you solve any significant problem, there may be real value there. Yeah, I think it's a great, it's a great point. Um, it's a kind of common point of dispute in the canon of entrepreneurial advice, right? Do you scratch your own itch or do you scratch someone else's itch? And I think I think it's really important to remember that you can scratch someone else's itch if you develop sufficient empathy and become obsessive about that itch. And just to be, if you're, as long as you're self-aware of that, of, of how difficult it can be to inhabit someone else's reality and thus make a corresponding commitment to understanding that reality so that you can build a product or service to make it better, then all good and plenty of entrepreneurs do that, right? They don't just scratch their own itch. Lots of entrepreneurs scratch other people's itches. And I think what the PayPal team demonstrates is, is that commitment and ability 
to understand uh, the eBay auction dynamic, even if they themselves are not eBay power sellers. Well, and I would actually take it a step further and say, like, let's extend the metaphor a bit. Let's say the itch is caused by poison ivy. What the PayPal team did is they covered themselves in poison ivy in order to understand what the itch felt like. So the first thing that happens after David Sachs and a small group of people discover that PayPal is successful on eBay is David tells the product team, go become eBay buyers, like go buy stuff on eBay, study every frame of this process, study every character. I want to know everything. We need to know everything. They do this thing that I actually didn't write about in the book. Um, this is, but I should have, and maybe I will in an updated edition. There was a designer, Ryan Donahue, who described to me sitting with 200 plus people in face-to-face in-person interviews where he was sometimes in their living room, just watching them use the product and talking to them about it. This is a digital company at the height of the internet boom, right? Doing advanced, you know, techno futuristic things. And he's in people's living rooms, like literally watching them press buttons just to see how they will function and then talking to them about it. So I think customer empathy can be a process that somebody builds. And for me, it was a big takeaway from this story. I was just reading uh, this morning about uh, some comments from the Collison brothers on early days of Stripe and how they did all these things that didn't scale, including like sitting with users and writing them handwritten thank you notes and getting, you know, answering phone calls uh, as the customer service agents themselves, et cetera. And so I do think it seems to be this universal truth among in the early days of startups is just the founders have to be, have, have to have really close proximity to that customer experience, even if it doesn't scale, even if it's weirdly, uh, antiquated seeming in terms of in-person interaction or what have you, uh, that does seem to be the norm here. So that's an excellent thing to highlight. Give me one other uh, insight or takeaway you think for entrepreneurs from the story. I love the heterogeneity um, uh, point uh, and the scratch your own itch point. What's another that would come to mind? Yeah. The story that's often misunderstood about PayPal is that it's an email payment money system. Emailing money is actually, I would argue, not the company's hallmark achievement. They brought that, that, that feature to scale, but what they really scaled successfully was fraud fighting. So what PayPal and other people have described this, but Max Levchin sort of says the best, he's like, what PayPal actually is, is this really complicated analytic system for determining whether an entity should process a transaction, right? So it's sort of a risk mitigation system for transactions. The only way that that can be said, the only way that that became a reality is because the company faced enormous amounts, millions of dollars per month flying out the door due to fraud. This was the problem that threatened to tank the company. And it wasn't a problem, number one, that the company could have predicted with any real accuracy. Number two, it was a hell of a hard problem to solve. Like it came in so many different forms. There was sort of garden variety fraud and then big fraudsters and international crime rings. It becomes the company's signature success because they commit to the problem solving required to fix it. It strikes me that in a weird way, like PayPal's company, PayPal as a company was only discoverable when fraudsters attacked the company, meaning that one of the problems that's annoying you day after day could actually be the thing that the rest of your industry hasn't figured out, right? So there could be startups that are literally sitting on a gold mine, meaning the problem itself. If they, if they reorient the company to focus on that problem. And I don't think that's an intuitive way to, to think about it because when a problem, when you have a, when you have a, a, a rock in your shoe, the instinct is to get rid of the rock in the shoe. But what if the rock is actually the valuable thing? Awesome. So let's uh, wrap by going through a few of the characters in the book. And I'd love just to, I'm going to say their name because you have some incredible characters that drive this story. And, and you tell it brilliantly, by the way, as it's a really well-written book. I highly recommend everyone check out the founders. Um, and so we get introduced to some really larger than life characters who now know uh, through some of their later achievements in building world-changing businesses. Uh, so I want to tick off some of their names and would love to hear 30 to 60 seconds each what you know what comes to mind what do you think is the most compelling or salient set of adjectives or takeaways or superpowers and of course these are complex people so you won't be able to do them justice but kind of what just immediately comes to mind as their essence based on all the time you've spent with them and researching them so let's start with uh, peter thiel i think he is one of if not the best talent spotter in the country uh, in the United States, maybe, maybe certainly ranks up there in the world, his ability to find people that other people might have written off 
and then become their champion is one of the things that's often not discussed about him. But I think it's one of the things that the people closest to him really admire. And these are people who are, by the way, fair judges of talent themselves. So when Max Levchin, and this isn't my opinion, it's when Max Levchin plays back to me, the thing that Peter does well is invest in, find people and sketch out for them the biggest vision of their lives. That to me is something that it's, it's not something that you immediately jumps to mind about him, but it's something I discovered in the course of doing the book. Max Levchin. Uh, an engineer's engineer until the end. Um, he is somebody who I think, you know, uh, this is someone who sort of does math homework for fun, right? Like he, he has this great line where he says like, my idea of a vacation is a beach with a big set of math problems. Um, I'll get to tell a small story to illustrate the point. I buried an enormous multi-hundred page secret code inside this book. Uh, the first, and at the moment, one of like three people to crack it is Max Levchin. And when I sent him the book, I mean, I wrote about his grandma. I wrote about him. I wrote a lot of stuff about his life. And the thing that entranced him was spending time breaking the secret code that I built in. And the book was sort of an afterthought. I thought it was, it spoke perfectly to the kind of person he is. And I think of it as, as one of the most endearing things about him. Elon Musk. Uh, conviction at a level that I'm not sure many of us can appreciate. Um, he has wanted to do many of the things that he does in technology since he was in his teens. And the way that I know that is I interviewed one of his first bosses and some of the people who worked with him right when he was in college and, and even studied some of the writing that he did that I found that was, was early. He has wanted, particularly with SpaceX, to do this for a long time. These are not things he hobbies he picked up because he was able to take the paypal exit and then turn it into spacex which is often like uh, i think it's a falsehood spread about him he has had long multi-decade long commitments to the things that he cares about in technology and i i think of that as admirable reed hoffman there is this incredible moment in the book when a colleague of reed hoffman's sits with him while he's on the phone and the, these Reed is negotiating with a competitor or a, a kind of one of the e companies in the orbit. And this person played back to me. He said, you know, Reed muted the phone and he would say, you know, Joe's going to say this, then Sue's going to say this, Steve's going to say this, and then I'm going to say this, and that's how it's all going to play out. Then Reed would unmute the phone and that's exactly how it would happen. I think that he is a master strategist and he has spoken about sort of the strategy board game part of his life in other places, but I think that actually undersells the level at which he can think three and four moves ahead in business. Uh, and I think that, you know, there's many other good things that can be said about him, but I think of this strategic piece as one of the things that requires a huge degree of empathy. You have to be able to literally put yourselves in the shoes of a competitor or a government in order to negotiate with him. And it's the thing that he adds to the story that very few people in this story can. And lastly, David Sachs. Um, the, the line that someone said to me, and this was a pretty serious person who saw the company from its earliest days to its last days. He said, there's no one I credit more with the success of PayPal than David Sachs. And the reason is because David Sachs cared about our end users almost more than anyone in the company, meaning the level of product focus and rigor that is required to think about every frame and every character and every field and every point of friction. That is what David brought to the company. It wasn't enough to build great technology. You had to have someone. I mean, and somebody described it. He was obsessed. He was obsessed with the customer experience and the product experience. And he pushed people. He demanded a lot. But he helped the company focus on the thing itself, the thing that actually adds value for users. Jimmy, uh, congrats on the book. I'll say it again for, for listeners to pick it up if you haven't already read it. It's called The Founders, The Story of PayPal and the Entrepreneurs Who Shaped Silicon Valley. Jimmy, thanks so much for being part of the Village Global Podcast. Ben, thanks so much for having me.